This evening we're in Isaiah 55, although I could have turned to any one of, you know, a hundred or more passages regarding the forgiveness of the Lord. It's certainly something he doesn't want us to miss. But let's look at it from Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55, I'd like to read verses 1 through 7, but particularly we're going to pay attention to verses 6 and 7. And let me just um, say this by way of reminder to those among our youth that are going to be making a public profession. Uh, as we talked about the elements of the gospel uh, this afternoon, one of the areas that there seemed to be a bit of a sticking point on was what it means to trust in the Lord Jesus. And I hope that we'll see that because that's, that's exactly what you have to do to receive this forgiveness. So we will look at that under this point and hopefully it will be a refreshment uh, for you in uh, helping you to understand these things. But let's begin by reading Isaiah 55 verses 1 through 7. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercies shown to David. Behold, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you will call a nation you do not know, and a nation which knows you not will run to you because of the Lord your God, even the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this evening. Again, our topic is God's abundant forgiveness in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as you know, this series has to do with why it is that you and I should love God. And there are many, many reasons why we should, uh, not the least of which you owe him absolutely everything that you have. <coughs> After all, God is the one who brought you into existence when before you didn't exist, you were nothing. And he has taken care of you your whole life. Every good thing that you have ever received has come from his hands, from the parents that you have, to the brothers and sisters and the friends and all the good things the Lord has given to you, the opportunities that he has provided for you throughout life. All of those things have come from the Lord. Those things don't happen accidentally. God is the one who has planned every single one of them. God has answered all of your prayers, maybe not exactly the way you wanted him to answer, but in the best way for you. God has promised to give you everything that you need throughout your entire life. You're never going to be without. And he has promised not only to continue to grant you existence throughout eternity, but to take care of you during that time frame as well. God is good. You wouldn't be what you are. You wouldn't be where you are. You wouldn't even be if it weren't for him. So, I mean, you owe him love just on that basis. But you know that we've been looking more particularly at his love, at, at the kind of person that he is, to remind us that he is worthy of your love, even if he hadn't done all these things. But of course, the fact that he has done all these things has revealed something about the Lord, and that is, of course, his love. We've seen that God is gracious, God gives you things that you do not deserve. You deserve really the opposite. You don't deserve good things. You deserve bad things. We all deserve bad things, but he has given you good things. He's gracious. He is compassionate. He is merciful. Everything that he has given to you has been an act of his mercy. Again, because you don't deserve it, and I don't deserve it. And of course, as we've seen, he is abounding in loving kindness something God has purposed from all eternity to give you in the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, in short, 
God is love. It doesn't just have it, it's not just a part of him, but it's something that adorns his whole being. Now this evening, let's consider another attribute of God, something else that flows from his love. Something else that's true about him that should make us love him uh, even more, and that is the fruit of forgiveness. I think we, um, sadly, so often take God's forgiveness for granted. The fact that he is forgiving. The fact that he promises to overlook our sins. I think more often than not, instead of thanking him, instead of loving him more for his forgiveness, we do tend to take advantage of it. We do what Paul tells us we should not do, sin that grace might abound. Instead of loving God for his forgiveness, we end up offending him for his love because we can. That's something obviously that we want to avoid and I think perhaps as we understand what it costs God to give us this forgiveness, perhaps it will help us not to return offense for his love, but rather to love him more. So let's consider four things this evening. First of all, what it means that God is forgiving. Secondly, why the Lord can be forgiving. Thirdly, what you must do to receive this forgiveness, and this is where I would actually have the youth uh, consider all of these things, but particularly this, and why you should love him more for his forgiveness and not less. So first of all, what does it mean that God is forgiving? Basically means that God will not hold you accountable for the sins that you have committed against him. Now I know that if you don't have a right view of what sin is and how God looks at your sin, you really can't appreciate what it is he's doing for you here. You need to realize what your sins would have cost you if it were not for God's forgiveness. You need to realize that every single thing that you and I do that is contrary to the will of God is an offense to him. But because God is infinitely holy, it is an infinite offense. Each one of them, even the slightest one, each one of them the Lord would have on the day of judgment placed as it were in the scales of his judgment. Each one of them would have uh, compelled him to push you further and further down into hell to justly punish you for those sins. And you would have had to suffer unimaginable suffering for all eternity. Your sins would have condemned you forever. Now that's what you deserve. But when God forgives, the slate, that record of your sins is wiped absolutely clean without one spot remaining. As he says in our uh, memory verse in Isaiah 1.18, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. The Lord will remove every stain, every blemish from you. Uh, the Lord says that he will remove them as far as they can possibly be removed. The psalmist says in Psalm 103 verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Just how far apart is east and west? Infinitely apart. They do not join. And the Lord says that he will no longer remember them against you in judgment, that he will forget them. This, this is a marvelous verse. I was actually tempted to use this one for our text, but had to get it in here somewhere. Micah 7, verses 18 and 19. And I would wager, it's a very unfamiliar verse to you, but this is one you really ought to read often. He says this, Who is a God like you, who pardons iniquity, and passes over the rebellious act of the remnant of his possession. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. And I think obviously what he's referring to here is not so much the literal sea, 
rather the sea of forgetfulness. He puts them out of his sight so that he no longer remembers them. Now, obviously, that doesn't mean that God doesn't remember what it is you've done because he has infinite knowledge. He knows perfectly well from all eternity every single sin you would ever commit and what those sins deserve. But what it does mean is that God has purpose no longer to bring these things up in judgment against you. As a matter of fact, your sins will no longer bias God in any way or influence his opinion of you any longer. Your slate is absolutely clean. And of course, when you add to that the absolute perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ, when God looks at you, he sees the perfection of his son. So his pardon, his forgiveness is full, it's complete. Not one of your sins is left. And another thing that is wonderful about the gospel and about the forgiveness of God is that that pardon, which is so full and so complete, is also final. These sins will never condemn you. No sin will ever condemn you from the time that he grants you forgiveness from that time forward. Jesus says this in John 10, 28, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. That statement of Jesus Christ could not be true unless your sins were fully and finally dealt with. That's exactly what the Lord does in forgiveness. He grants to you heaven. I draw your attention to one of the quotes on the back of your bulletin. Wonderful quote by John Owen. He says this, Poor souls are apt to think that all those whom they read or hear of to be gone to heaven went there because they were so good and so holy. Yet not one of them, not anyone that is now in heaven, Jesus Christ alone accepted, ever came there any other way but by forgiveness of sins. You need to realize what the forgiveness of sins is. It is heaven. God gives you heaven when you deserve hell. So that's what forgiveness is, wonderful thing. Secondly, why can the Lord forgive? How can God do this when he is absolutely holy and absolutely just and infinitely so, when God can't overlook sin? The Bible says he can't. He must punish every single one. How can he do this? I mean, you know what you feel like when you see injustices committed, how it just creates, I hope, a righteous indignation. But when you see somebody who has murdered many people, or even just one person, when you see that person not justly punished, how does that make you feel? Or when you see many or anyone just not being punished justly for their crimes, how does that make you feel? Well, God, who is infinitely holy and infinitely righteous and just, it makes him feel those things in a pure way, infinitely more. God's justice requires that every sin be fully paid. Every injustice must be fully requited. God cannot pass over even the smallest sin. He can't brush it away. He can't pretend that it didn't happen. If God is to forgive, he has to have a just reason. Thankfully, God has provided his own reason for forgiving in the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, children, pay attention to this because this is what you must trust in in order to be saved in the payment that Jesus Christ made on the cross for everyone who will trust in him. Again, I would just remind you that your sins in God's eyes are infinite. Any one of them, even the single sin, could condemn you forever. But remember, you've committed far more than one sin. You came into this world guilty of Adam's sin. And though we don't like to think about it, if we understand the scriptures correctly, every single thought that you and I have thought was sinful. Nothing we have thought has ever been pure. Every word we have spoken, every action is guilty, it makes us guilty before the Lord, every single one of them before you came to the Lord Jesus Christ, was purely sin. 
and those even afterwards, not purely thankfully, but even those things that we have done after we came to the Lord Jesus Christ, every single one of those has not been absolutely pure, which means even these things are offensive to an infinitely holy God. But Jesus has made a payment for those sins. Jesus has made a payment that is equal to those sins because Jesus being God is infinite. Now remember, there's no way that you could ever have paid for your crimes. You couldn't work them off because the Lord says you owe him perfect obedience by virtue of the fact that he made you. So how could you offer him something to pay a debt that you owe him anyway? You couldn't, but when you really stop and think about the works that you could offer to him, all you can offer are imperfect, imperfect works, which means those works don't deserve any reward, they just deserve further punishment. So you're saying, here Lord, Receive this as payment, and all you're doing is offending him more and more with your sins. You cannot pay for your sins. Only Jesus could have paid for them, because only he is perfect. Only he is infinitely worthy. And that's exactly what he did when he suffered on the cross. All of the sins, all of them of every single person who had put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, every single one of those sins was laid on the Lord Jesus Christ. And God poured his wrath out on his son for those sins. And all those sins were justly satisfied for fully and finally. God cannot forgive unless there is a just payment made Jesus made that payment. He made it in full. He made it completely. He made it finally for you if you're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, again, the third point is what do you have to do to receive this forgiveness? And again, I've already told you, and this is where I want our youth again to tune in. You have to trust him. You have to trust Jesus. You know, the word that's often used in Scripture is believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And that is true. If you do that in the way that is meant by that word, you will be saved. But the word there means more than just simply knowing facts and believing those facts are true. The devil knows and he believes that they're true. He knows they're true. But he's not saved because believing the facts doesn't save you. Only trusting Jesus will save you. You have to look away from what you've done, which we've already seen are imperfect works, which are infinitely offensive to God, and you need to look to what Jesus Christ has done, because what he did was perfect obedience, and that is the obedience that the Father will accept. He will accept what Jesus has done. Jesus has offered to give that obedience to you, that record to you, if you will simply trust him for it. You need to trust in his death on the cross, his atonement, to take away your sins, to pay fully that debt that you owe to God's justice, which is infinite. You need to trust Jesus Christ, his obedience, his death. But there's one other thing that you need to do, as our text reminds us, and actually it was put this way more often in the Old Testament, and that is repent. You need to repent. Repent of your sins. You know, it's so often said today in so many evangelical churches, just believe. And I, I think so many people hear that and again think, if I just believe the facts, I'll be saved. And then they, their lives don't change because there's no actual trust in Jesus. And they're also encouraged, or at least they're told, they don't have to repent of their sins. The college that I went to taught that very thing. You don't have to repent of your sins. You just simply have to change your mind about who Jesus is and you will be saved. Well, again, the devils know who Jesus is and they're not saved. The Lord doesn't tell us you just need to change your mind. You do if you have the wrong idea about Jesus. But your whole life needs to change. Your whole life needs to turn around. Listen to what, again, Isaiah says in Isaiah 55, 7, or at least what the Lord says through Isaiah, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let them return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him and to our God 
for he will abundantly pardon. Let's not miss the condition there, which is forsaking your sins and turning away from your evil thoughts. The, the Bible is replete with that. What is it that Peter said on the day of Pentecost? But repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. He didn't even actually say believe because the gospel can be summarized by the word believe if you understand it properly and the word repent because they're both flip sides of the same thing. I turn from my sins and I turn to Christ and trust in him alone for my salvation. If you're to be forgiven, you do need to turn from the things that you do that offend God. Even the things that, that you think are sinful, again, whatever is not of faith is sin. If you think it's wrong, you've got to turn from those things as well, and you need to turn to the Lord. He says, turn from those things and return to the Lord. Now, I think that this can apply to people who have never been the Lord's to begin with, as well as those who may be the Lord's, who have turned away from him for one reason or another and backslidden, because everyone has fallen in Adam and has turned away from the Lord's. But the Lord says, return now. Return in the Lord Jesus Christ. Return through him. He is the door. If you do, he will have compassion on you. He will pardon you abundantly. He's not just going to make it so you squeak by, but you are going to be fully and finally pardoned of all your sins. So God's forgiveness is full, it's complete, and it's final, and it's based upon the work of Jesus Christ, which alone can save you. And if you are to receive it, you must come to Jesus. You must trust in Him, in His obedience and in His death to save you, His obedience to make you perfect before God, His death to pay your debt to God's justice. And you need to turn around. You need to turn from your sins. You need to trust in the Lord. Now, the last point is, how should you respond, basically, to this forgiveness? What should it produce in your life? Why should you love him more and not less for his forgiveness? I mean, doesn't that sound like a ridiculous question at this point? Why should you love God more for forgiving you of your sins and not less? But sadly, many do. So many use forgiveness not as a reason to love the Lord, but as a reason to sin more. I mean, if the Lord's going to forgive me for my sins, why not sin? Why not sin that grace might abound? As Paul says, some had twisted the grace of God to actually mean. Why not indulge in the things of the world when you can still have heaven? Why not have your cake and eat it too? Well, you can't do this because God won't allow you to do this. He won't allow you by way of command. Basically, we saw that this morning. The Lord says, if you decide to go the way of the world, if you choose to hold on to your life in this world, you will lose your life. You will lose your immortal soul. But if you die to yourself in this world, if you pick up your cross and follow after him, you will gain your life. You will gain eternal life. So the Lord tells you in no uncertain terms, that's what you must do. That's why Jesus rebuked Peter. He said, get behind me, Satan. You are setting your mind on man's interest, on your interest, and not on God's. If you keep doing that, you'll be lost. You need to give up what you want, and you need to follow me, Jesus says. But not only does God not allow you to do that by way of command, he also will not allow you to do it by way of the new nature. Paul writes again in Romans 6, verses 1 and 2, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we, who died to sin, still live in it? Again, I, I point those people who believe that you don't have to repent of your sins to this verse. How can you, who have died to sin, still live in it? You need to realize that your ability to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ in the first place came through the Holy Spirit. But where the Holy Spirit changes your heart to give you the ability to trust in Jesus, He changes your whole nature. He changes 
the whole direction of your life. You won't look at sin as desirable anymore. It will no longer appear as cake, but rather it will appear for what it really is. The Bible says it's filth. It's dung. Now, sadly, sometimes the corruption that's inside of you will still make it appear far too often like cake. But grace, the grace that God gives to you will help you see it as it really is. And you will not want to continue to eat it. Now, either way, by way of commandment or by way of the new nature, you will not use God's grace as an excuse to sin. His forgiveness won't encourage you to keep doing the things that offend him because those things will also offend you. You know that if you're a believer, sin is offensive, and when you commit it, you hate it. You may have liked it for the moment, but once you've committed it, you realize it is evil in his eyes, and you hate it and turn away from it. So instead of encouraging you to sin more, forgiveness will actually move you to love him more to thank Him more for delivering you from sin, especially when you consider what it cost the Lord to purchase that forgiveness for you. And that was the price of His own Son. And so forgiveness is not an encouragement to sin, but it is encouragement to love the Lord more. And that really brings us to the point of this whole sermon, which is why it is you should love God. God is a forgiving God. Can you love a God like this? Now, for those of you who haven't trusted in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, you realize that God offers you, through His Son, a full and complete and final forgiveness. Apart from Jesus Christ, you're like a condemned convict heading to execution, guilty of crimes that are worthy of death, Worse than death, but worthy of eternal death, punishment for many, many crimes. And yet the judge stands ready to offer you a full pardon. All you have to do is simply receive it. Just look to his son, not up in the sky or wherever it is you might be looking physically, but in faith to him. He's made a promise Believe that promise. He promises to give you his record of perfection if you will just simply look to him for it, believe him for it, trust him for it. He has promised that he will pay for all your sins, that he has, in fact, if you have trusted him, if you will trust him, because of his sacrifice on the cross. You just need to look to him and believe his promise. Take him at his word and receive this gift that he offers to you. If you will receive him, if you will receive his promise and believe it and trust him, he will feel it freely, fully, and finally pardon you. So the question that this text asks you this evening is, will you receive that forgiveness and live? Or will you turn away from him again? and run the risk of eternal damnation. You know if you die in your sins apart from Jesus Christ, you will suffer eternally. Now, if you're already a believer here this evening, realize that that is exactly where you were in danger of hell, and yet the Lord has forgiven you because you've trusted in His Son. He has set you free from an eternity of suffering, something that you justly deserved. And now what is it that you should do for him? Well, again, as we've seen, far from continuing to offend him by sinning against him, you should love him. So the question this text asks you this evening is this, do you love him? As you think about the kind of God that he is, doesn't it move your heart to love him even more strongly? And lastly, do you realize that God is also perfectly willing to forgive whoever will come to him through the Lord Jesus Christ? And shouldn't that be an encouragement to you to offer Jesus Christ to others so that they might be forgiven as well? 
We do need to remember the gospel is not only a command, repent and believe, but it is also an offer. Anyone who wills can come and buy and eat without money. They can have their sins removed. Jesus, well, the Lord says through Isaiah in our memory verse, come and let us reason together. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be white as snow. I realize in the summer, sometimes we forget what white snow looks like, but freshly fallen snow in bright sunlight is quite a bright white, probably the brightest white I've seen. But that's how pure the Lord will remove the sins. He will make you pure and as white as snow. And that's something he offers not only to you, but he offers to whosoever will come. All you have to do then is present the Lord Jesus Christ to someone. If you don't do that, if they don't hear about Jesus, they will remain stained red as scarlet, and they will perish in their sins forever. But if you tell them about Jesus Christ, perhaps the Lord will have mercy on them. God says he will draw all men to himself. He says that he will work through our witness. He does say that he's not sending us out on a fool's errand. He will gather his sheep together. All we have to do is simply tell them. We don't have to grab them and shake them or any of that type of thing. We do need to, of course, try to move them with what we have to say and with reasons why they should receive the Lord. But really, it's up to the Lord to save them. Again, as we saw a couple weeks ago, they need to hear the gospel, but the Lord needs to work by his Holy Spirit. As the Lord said to Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, Peter, but my Father who is in heaven. So realizing that God offers full forgiveness and salvation to all men, may the Lord give us the grace we need, the love we need for the lost that would move us to bring the good news to him. We have the opportunity this upcoming Saturday to invite people to hear the gospel. Stay Bush would proclaim it. And also a picnic to boot, swimming pool to swim in, all kinds of reasons why perhaps some, some would like to come. Don't hide the fact that the gospel is going to be there, but don't hide the fact that there's going to be fun and food either. Perhaps the Lord will bring people there on account of the fun and the food and will bring them to himself through the gospel. So let's invite and let's pray that the Lord would use that to save souls. Well, let's spend a few moments now in prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us apply his word this evening.